Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming to our React Meetup um, for November. Uh, we're going to start in just a minute. I have a few quick announcements, uh, and then I'll hand it off to Ben um, to take things uh, from there. So first announcement, next month, uh, we're going to take December off. So um, I'm going to probably be in a tropical country or with my family or something. Um, and hopefully, you all will be, will be there as well, or well, at your own family's house, not mine. Um, and uh, we're looking for speakers that are interested in lining up for Q1 of next year. So if you're interested uh, in speaking, or you have an idea for a talk, um, or even just want to discuss an idea, you're welcome to reach out to me through the Meetup group. Um, I, I'd love to give a big round of applause to uh, the Refinery29 team. Thank you guys so much for, for having us here. The space is great. Uh, all the food, all the drinks. Um, and without further ado, I will let uh, Ben take it from here. So here you go. Thank you. <coughs> All right, thank you, David. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, Friday night, Phi Dye, so your nightcap options are limited. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Ben. Um, I'm the, the tech lead for mobile and emerging platforms at uh, Refinery29. Um, we do like the mobile web experience, and uh, we've, we've started playing around a little bit with native. And um, JavaScript's taken over the world, so let's talk about it. Um, I think like the latest front has been all these sort of like you know native inroads that that these companies are making, and in particular, we got very excited about React Native. Uh, I think in April, and we started prototyping things. So, uh, you know, first we, we were looking for opportunities just to prototype uh, our content and sort of new form factors, and what could we do with persistent data and push notifications and things like that, and. Uh, it, it was pretty great. We were pretty excited about it. So then uh, we had an opportunity for our Fashion Week event, 29 Rooms, to do something experiential. Um, we had one of the rooms was um, around politics, and it was um, we just had like a, like different prompts inside of voting booths, and uh, people could record a video response. Uh, in the three days that we had it running, we had about 750 people play with the experience, and uh, this is all written in React Native, and we actually overlay like your, your legal information over the top of the video, because uh, we couldn't figure out how to futz with the metadata. <laughs> um, and it was a lot of fun, and we really built it in like a couple of days. And then uh, we started to look at what could we actually put out into the world. Um, and so we looked at our content franchises that we were already producing, and one of them is This AM, and it's a story that we write every day. Um, and it gives you just eight things that you should know for that day so that you don't look like a dunce at the water cooler. And we thought, this is perfect. It's, it's, um, it's ritual. It's habitual. Uh, here's what it actually looks like uh, with our, our fake um, Sinatra API server populating the data. But you essentially, you just get like a, a little bit of like a headline, a little bit of context, and uh, you, know, you can click on any one of these cards to read the story in like a little browser view that we have. And um, if you go back, uh, yeah, there's like you know native share sheets. Uh, we're able to use all that stuff, and we're going to make this app look a little jazzier later in the presentation. But when you get to the very end, uh, you know we give you like a little delight card. In this particular instance, it's a cat. Um, so that's kind of like the application that we wanted to test out, and we have about 200 users right now. We push them. Uh, push notifications daily. Um, they're bespoke to what the content is for that day, and we sort of look at the open rates and all that. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. So um, that was the demo. Okay. Uh, so at a certain point, we decided, like, hey, we could probably, you know, get this out into the market and really get our users using it. And so that's when you have to throw away the prototype and actually build the thing right. And for us, that usually comes down to behavior-driven development. So um, just just a quick show of hands here. Like, how many people have heard of React Native? How many people have experimented with React Native? A little less? OK. How many people are familiar with like the Flux app unidirectional data flow stuff? OK. So this talk's going to get a little heavy into some of those details and some of the, the, the you know, clever hacks that we've done around that. Um, and you know, for us, like, testing is king. And so I'm going to hand it over to Carlo to talk to you a little bit about how we test apps in the native uh, realm. Thanks, Ben. Hey guys, I'm Carlo. Um, I'm a software engineer over at the international team here at Refinery29. So testing, right? So here at Refinery29, we're very much all about best practices. We want to kind of approximate 
um, something as close to TDD as possible with the con constraints of you know business needs and all that. So um, basically, there are three pillars I'm going to talk about here, which consist of the unit tests that we write for our components, uh, the feature, the end-to-end -end feature tests that we write, and um, to tie it all together, kind of the continuous integration environment that we use so that we can run all of our tests when we push stuff to production. So let's start with unit tests, right? Basically, you know, same, same deal as anyone else's React app. We want complete code coverage for everything we have in there, um, all of our actions, all of our components, all of our stores. Uh, usually that's pretty straightforward. The one pain point for React Native is that a lot of the methods that you'll call from the methods you define will actually be defined on um, the Objective-C or Swift side. For us, it's Objective-C. For you guys, it might be Swift. And we were actually just talking about this earlier. Mo all of the business logic is in the JavaScript, but there are some things that you'll need to methods you'll need to call on the Objective C side, and you'll want to test that. So the you know the classical way of uh, solving this problem is to kind of just mock those methods out, and just check that they were called. And for that reason, uh, we found in Jest, which is uh, the Facebook endorsed unit test framework, a great tool for us to write these unit tests. And uh, for, for those who aren't familiar, Jest is pretty much the same thing as Jasmine, which is the very popular behavi behavioral driven development framework, with one uh, huge difference, which is that where in Jasmine you specify which things you want to mock out, with Jest, everything is mocked out by default, and you have a blacklist of things that you don't want to mock out. And that actually worked reasonably well for us, with some exceptions, which I'll go into in a bit. But yeah, so anything that in your source file that has um, any require function will be mocked out. So if you require some function from a library, that'll be mocked out. If you require some class, that'll be mocked out. And you can specify exceptions, like the blacklist I said earlier. So one big thing we ran into with this approach, we could, we could mock out stuff for our actions really well. We could mock out stuff for our stores really well. When it came to our custom components, Right, testing a uh, unit testing a component um, should be pretty simple. You really just uh, test the render method, see that it outputs what you want it to output. But we, we ran into a pretty big issue when we did that, because it turns out that Jest doesn't play very nice with the built-in React Native components that our custom components uh, use in their render methods. So um, to explain why that's the case, uh, just to build out all these mocked functions kind of traverses the entire structure of your app, goes through all the require statements, looks at stuff and, and sees, is this a function? If it's a function, let's mock it out and have it be this mock function that returns nothing but has a bunch of watchers, et cetera. That whole traversal process doesn't really go well in the React Native uh, module. And the reason for that is that there's just a lot of global variables that are being used in that module that, re that are defined on the iOS or Android side. So a lot of stuff just breaks when you try to do it um, out of the box. So for a long time, we weren't able to uh, uh, unit test our components. Um, so to kind of get around that, we have a pretty hacky solution, but that works for uh, the very basic unit tests we want to write for our components. And here, um, I'll go through what we, uh, how we built that. So basically, to override an auto-mocked module in Jest, you just place a file under the underscore, underscore, mocks, underscore, underscore folder with that module's name. So this is what we started with. Basically, the first thing we do is pull in React, not React Native. And then that's, that's kind of sort of React Native, right? But not really, because we don't have all the stuff we need for our actual unit tests. We don't have the image um, component, we don't have the text component, we don't have the activity indicator component. So we need some component, some object here, mock components, that'll be the, the mocked versions of those. Um, this isn't the solution yet, but this is basically what we need, right? We need something that's activity indicator, we need something that's text, we need something that's scroll view. We want to make it so that when we're running the tests and there's a line in the code that says new image.render, or however the JSX for that looks like, it'll just give us something very easy to maybe regex, which kind of sucks, but something very easy to inspect, like, like image. And the, the hacky solution we found for that was just 
uh, for each of these components we want to mock, we just basically create a new React class that um, has an element uh, with the name of the component that you're making. And the render function, basically, all it does is just renders what the JSX already is. So for example, image will be rendered as image. And then that lets us kind of look at at least do the very basic unit testing. So say I have a custom component that renders two images on top of each other. I just mock out image, and then um, in my test, I just check, OK, when I, when I call render on my custom component, does it render two image things next to each other? So pretty straightforward. So moving on to feature tests. So just a brief uh, aside about nomenclature. Some people call these integration tests. Some people call these feature tests. It doesn't matter. They're all the same. Uh, we really we have a stack that consists of Calabash and Cucumber, and we have a fake API uh, to kind of serve up uh, mock data from our API, and we have Webpack to kind of serve the React Native assets. So Calabash is the whole framework that's kind of responsible for launching an instance of the simulator and interacting directly with the app. They give a few things that make writing feature tests really easy. Uh, they give a bunch of step definitions for um, the cukes that you'll write. And the interactions that it lets you do are pretty limited, but it's stuff that it's basic stuff that you need for an end-to-end -end feature test. So it lets you swipe through the app, it lets you look at text, it lets you get image names using the accessibi accessibility label on the image. So it's enough. Um, it's not going to test every single aspect of your app, but um, the unit tests kind of fill in that blank. So here's an example, right? Um, just a very basic use case of someone opening the app and scrolling through the feed. When I'm on the landing page, I wait until I see Friday, it would be today. When I scroll down, wait for a second, I see this. When I scroll down, I see this. And uh, let me actually run that real quick. Oops. This has about a 50% chance of actually working, so. So usually uh, issues we run into with it are usually like the simulator was already open or we built it wrong in Xcode or stuff like that. And we've tried to hammer out most of the most common issues, but we still run into things from time to time. But it looks like it might have worked this time, so that's cool. So yeah, very basic. It just uses the app like anyone would, and it inspects very uh, simple, kind of using very simple selectors. Uh, let's go back here. Yeah. Whoops. All right. Thank you. So the um, the step definition definitions used in those actually delegate mostly to predefined Calabash step definitions for the most part. So for example, I wait until I see the day of the week just says uh, just aliases to I wait to see blah, which is a predefined Calabash step that looks for some text in the page. Uh, I'm not going to go through each and every one of these, but for example, um, I should see the blah image uses the very powerful method in Calabash query to look at all the image views, gets each of their, uh, gets each of their labels and, exp and finds the one you're looking for in that array of labels. So more or less pretty straightforward stuff. It's once you kind of get a hang of uh, Calabash's API, it's really easy to write these step definitions. Uh, so kind of tying it all together and making sure we, you know, we have a build we can actually run every time we push up a pull request. At Refinery29, we use Travis, which is uh, the hosted and open source um, continuous integration suite um, on GitHub that integrates with GitHub. Travis has a bunch of pre-built VMs for running uh, whatever kind of test suite your app might require. We use the one that has an OS X image and that installs Xcode because we definitely need Xcode. But technically, you can, you can write your Travis configuration script to install any sort of open source package you want, because you can make it run anything. Uh, we've, we just found this is the path, the path of least resistance. So just an aside before I continue, I was doing some research for this slide, and the second sentence um, on the Travis Wikipedia is kind of funny. It's like, the guy says, although the source is available piecemeal, blah, 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 it appears unlikely that casual users could successfully integrate it on their own platforms. 
It's like, clearly this person tried to like look up the source, couldn't hack it, <laughs> building it on their own machine. I was just like, well, oh, apparently this isn't for casual users such as myself. So not the most, kind of adversarial, I don't know. Anyway, here's our uh, Travis YAML, which is our configuration file. Um, pretty straightforward, it just tells us which image we're using. Th that wasn't the whole thing, sorry. This is just the first part, and this is the next one, which is splitting up the suite into two things, which is we want one of the builds to run all the unit tests, we want the other to run feature uh, tests. And the way you do that in Travis is you specify different environment variables, and um, it splits up the build automatically based on the entries in this array uh, and sets that environment variable for each entry. So I, I actually skipped a bunch, but once we're done installing everything, node, uh, in, uh, running bundle install, whatever, uh, this is some of the interesting things that happen on the feature test build, which, it, which in retrospect is kind of hacky too. But um, we want to start the Webpack server because we want to serve uh, the React native assets, so we run npm start. And then, so you might wonder why we're actually curling the Webpack server right here. It's actually because when you curl the Webpack server, it does some additional work because it's the first time you curled it. And we found that when you let the feature test suite do that, instead of doing it yourself first, that actually makes the test run a lot slower. And sometimes uh, Travis completely bails. So we have this whole before, prepare everything before you actually run the tests that um, curls, uh, the Webpack server to kind of warm it up, which, is, which isn't ideal, but it, it, our, our builds pass as a, result, as a result of this. We also have to sleep after we start the Webpack server because we're starting it in the background. And then this is the, mo the last line is the most important line because this is actually a custom script we, we wrote that basically does the command line version of going into Xcode and hitting build on your project, that XE build cal thing. So, and this is where the actual tests are run. So if we're in the unit test build, we run npm test, which just runs um, just on everything. If you're in the feature test build, you'll run Cucumber on the whole spec folder. Pretty straightforward. We kind of force a specific simulator on that. And then this is kind of the whole thing um, from start to bottom. Pretty straightforward. There's a lot of like boilerplate, install node, install IOJS, whatever. So, some further optimizations um, that some of you might have already picked up on. Instead of using sleep statements, it'd be cool to write a kind of script that boots up that server and um, lets us actually continue with the build when it's booted up. Uh, one thing we did on our mobile web app, which has a lot more feature tests, is that we parallelized it into four builds instead of just one. So that'd be a, like an easy win, uh, just because they'd run a smaller subset of the tests. And of course, you know, there's no point to all of this sort of TDD test-driven utopia if we don't actually write tests. So we're gonna write a lot more feature tests and hopefully make our process a lot more TDD. Um, and um, there's really no point in writing tests if we don't have any code to test. So to talk about how we use some libraries to write that code is Ilana. Hey, um, so I'm Alana. I'm a software dev here at Refinery. Um, and adding libraries to Xcode is really unintuitive, so I'm actually gonna start by showing you how that process works. So the first thing we have to do is actually add the JavaScript in the first place, so npmi it like you might expect. We're gonna do um, React Native video. Um, I think our app looks pretty good right now, but I want videos in it, I don't know, jazz it up a bit. Cool, um, so now we go to Xcode. And we have to add the Objective-C library. Um, so you go to your libraries folder and uh, click to add files. And you have to find it in the node module that you just installed. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of steps. Um, find the Xcode project, click to add it. Make sure all your targets are specified. And now we have to manually link the binaries. Cool, so we go to build phases link binary with libraries, scroll down to the bottom, click plus. It's pretty good at uh, finding which ones you might need. Yeah, so we're gonna add it. Um, cool, and now we have to actually add it to the project. Uh, so let's get the code open. 
I also have to restart Packager. Sometimes you do. It's really inconsistent. Um, well, that was bad. Yeah. Oh, try killing all. Yeah, whatever. The process is really awesome, and nothing bad ever happens. Great, so it'll start up again any second. Great. Oh, almost. <laughs> Anyone know any good jokes <laughs> besides Xcode? <laughs> Too soon, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Cool. All right. So let's let's at least add it. Um, so you have to require it, um, like you might expect. And then, um, luckily, I already have the code written. Um, that won't normally happen. Uh, so great. Um, we want it to be an app-wide video in the background. So we're in our app.js component, and um, we're just going to copy and paste this video code. Um, just for simplicity's sake, we already have the asset in the project already because that's its own adventure. Um, so you can see that we just have the background video specified. And I'm hoping it'll build one of these days. Yay. Great, awesome. Cool, um, so now we have a video background. Um, interesting to note though, um, we're not mobile developers, so we didn't anticipate this, but because it's playing in the background, uh, like the phone interprets it as something that it shouldn't shut down because it wants to be showing you the video. So we had to actually write something to pause it after a certain amount of time. But if you ever interact with it again, it starts up. Cool. Yeah, so fancy. Um, great. So let's go back to the presentation. Awesome. Um, so a lot of people forget the steps. You're going to have to Google it a thousand times when you first start, uh, but it is worth it. <coughs> Also, forking is your friend. Um, React Native is really new. It's always changing. Um, chances are you'll probably find a library that is most of what you need. But um, close enough is usually as good as you're going to get. So we pretty much had to fork most of the libraries that we used. So to show you what, an example, um, let's talk about React Native Google Analytics. Um, it came with support for like screen views and page views right out of the box. But we wanted custom dimensions, which are a lot like custom variables, if you're familiar with those, so that we could correlate the date. Um, so all we did was we made a custom dimensions array. And then every time uh, that we send anything to Google Analytics, we, we push in um, a custom dimension to it. And it just goes along with the other uh, anything else that we send. And then uh, we made an app-wide util um, that we can call, like track screen view, you can see. Not only are we setting the screen view, but we're also pushing uh, this custom dimension into it, which is just the date. And then when it sends the screen view, it sends all of that data. Cool. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Emily to talk about fun and fancy utilities. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm also a developer here. Um, so we talked about some libraries and stealing code from other people. Uh, here's some ideas that maybe you could take. Um, you can steal from us. So the first one is image with dynamic label. Um, it's just what it sounds like. Uh, we're automatically adding a network images source file name as the images accessibility label. Um, and you might be saying, why would we want to do that? Uh, there are two different types of images uh, with React Native. There is the static images that come with your app. Um, you just ship it with your app. And then there are the networked images, um, which are pointing to, like, for example, refinery29.com. Um, so in the example that we showed you before scrolling through all the cards, um, we were using a lot of network images. Uh, and in order to find those images in our feature tests, um, this is what we're using. Uh, so basically, we're just not <laughs> changing slides yet. We're just <laughs> um, 
we're extending the image, uh, then we are setting the accessibility label with get label. Um, get label checks to see is this a network image. Uh, if it's not, we're going to throw an error. Um, if there is a hard-coded accessibility label, then use that. Um, otherwise, we're going to get the file name, and we're going to set the accessibility label to that so it actually makes sense. Uh, so that's one thing that you can use. Um, and then we have image dimensions with percentages. <coughs> uh, so there are some issues that we ran into for our done card. Um, if you remember, it was the card with the cat on it. Uh, usually that's going to be a GIF image, and we don't ever know if it's going to be landscape or if it's going to be portrait. Um, in React Native, all images are required to have a height and a width to display at all. Um, these dimensions can only be pixel values right now. Um, and we wanted to use like a percentage so that we could keep the ratio of the image but make it as big as possible within a contained space. Um, and like a bunch of other people also <laughs> using React Native, uh, we just want to be able to use percent values like you would with CSS. Um, so don't judge me too much on this library. Um, it promises to only be a thing. Um, <laughs> but basically, you can pass it a number, a percentage that you want, um, and it will return to you the number of pixels um, based on the uh, device dimensions. So like, write your own version of that. <laughs> um, and then in the store, you can see where it's used. Uh, we have something called set done card dimensions. And like here, for example, um, use your version of this library to, um, let's see, at some point when we have a portrait image, we're setting a max height um, using, for example, 84% of the device's height. Um, and then in the end, we're setting the max height and width here onto the card. And then here's what it looks like actually in for example, the image with dynamic label that I was talking about just before this. Um, we're just extending a width and a height object onto this um, image style. So that's something else that you might find helpful in your projects. And here's Ben again to talk about native modules. Thank you. OK. so. I I promise you this is like the last section we're doing. Um, there's a lot of pieces to this thing, and you try and do as much as you can inside JavaScript because that's a preferred language of choice. But every once and again, you got to reach you got to reach over into the Objective C side to get some things done. An example of that again is like we use Parse for push notifications. Parse has no incentive to add iOS push notifications to their JavaScript SDK. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So we have, to, we have to dip into Objective-C to, to get a few things done. And, uh, and one of those things in the case of our app was we uh, were loading an add-in on that initial landing page. So we needed to use Google's uh, native ad rendering tools. So we, we pulled in their uh, classes. We're not sophisticated enough to yet to use CocoaPods, but we'll get there. And uh, basically, you can just write a tiny bit of Objective-C to wrap an existing Objective-C like class, and uh, and be able to use it within your JSX and be able to like you know pass callbacks uh, through JavaScript. So um, the header file basically you bring in like your uh, the React Native View Manager, and then you're going to add the delegates for the bridge module because you're going to do a little bit of communication here. And inside the implementation, uh, the the key things here are you need to you need to export the module so that um, so that React Native knows to like make this addressable through your JavaScript. Uh, honestly, I don't know enough beyond that, but it gets it done. Um, and then we wrapped our Google Ads class, and we call it React Native Google Ads. And in this uh, this view function, we're just returning that class. And then you can see at the bottom here, um, there's actually a method for um, blah, blah, exporting view properties, and these are like properties that you can then use on your JSX component. Uh, so for instance, for ads, we needed size, we needed target, and we needed uh, custom. And you can see here, there's these um, Objective-C designations for NS array, NS string, and NS dictionary. And the cool thing is, I think from like 
iOS 7 on, they have like an automatic conversion between object literals and NS dictionary and like arrays and NS arrays. So that's all sort of magically handled for you. Uh, so the class looks like this. We're extending a React view. We're using the Google Ads um, view delegates to know when the ad's been loaded or if there was a problem with some of the parameters we passed in, things like that. And you can see the implementation of that. Cool. Um, oh, where are we? Yeah, so a lot of this is just about like setting up your render layer and actually like calling through to the, the DFP banner view. Uh, this is where it gets real Objective-C like. And uh, you can Google for it, it's fine. Uh, and then you, you're going to want to set all your setters that you set up for your view props for JSX. So here we're just setting, you know, again, like the size is an array and all that stuff. We pass it in and, and we get an ad back. And then at the bottom, you'll see that we have a couple of delegates. We haven't done anything really super cool with this yet, but when we get the, the delegate back for ad view did receive ad, we go ahead and, and we animate it in. And what the hell, we we're in Objective C and we're like, we'll just fade it in on this side. Um, so that's essentially it. And you know, we're not Objective-C developers, but it doesn't seem like you have to really know a whole lot of that to, to, to muscle through <laughs> so far. Uh, and then the way that manifests itself in the JSX is you're going to require in your new component, and then you'll see we're using it somewhere much, much further down this crazy file. There we go. So here's the add tag. You can see we have custom where we're passing in an object. There's our size with the array, and then our target. And so that renders the ad that you see on the, the landing page in the app. And so that's a little bit of dipping a toe into Objective-C. Um, so I think at this point, um, we did that. Cool. Yeah. So thank you, uh, everybody, for coming out. And we want to. We just wanted to open up the, the floor both for questions and like honestly, like this is also nascent, we're still learning. So if anybody knows of anything really cool and you just want to blurt that out, go for it. So do we have questions? So uh, right here at the end you were describing, you, got, you said you dipped your toe into Objective-C and since you didn't really have a bias towards that, why'd you lean towards Objective-C instead of Swift? Good question. So React Native is actually written in Objective-C. So you can, you can write Swift, but you have to write something called a bridging module okay. to be able to do that. And certainly a lot of people are doing that because they prefer the syntax of Swift. I do too, frankly. But it was just like, uh, <laughs> we got, you know, like we haven't, like if I have to write more than 50 lines, absolutely. We're going to bridge some modules and Swift it up or I don't know, hire an iOS developer or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, are you building an Android app as well? And if so, how did you enjoy like the React Native? I know Android is pretty new for React Native, so how is that? Received? Yeah. So one thing. So starting back in April, one thing we learned right off the bat was to like wait for the community. We spent like two weeks working on an animation library, and then like three days later, React Native was like, "We got our animation library. It's perfect." And so it was all for naught. <laughs> and Calabash didn't work at all when we first started. So we were just like, "We're going to wait and let the community solve some of these problems." And you know, Android's getting closer all the time, but like I still look in issues, and it's like, "Hey, we're getting pretty close to being able to work with animated GIFs." And I'm like, "Yeah, we're going to hold off." And what you know, we we keep our project up to date enough that we could definitely run down that road. And since you keep all your business logic in a shared source directory. You know, it's going to be more about trying to get the look and feel right, and then of course using I don't know GSM. However, you do push notifications in Android, it looks like a nightmare. But we'll have to like solve for that. Yes. Is Refinery Twenty Nine hiring? <laughs> 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 That was not a plant. Yeah, you can come see me after the uh, event. We'll talk. Yeah, we have we have some open roles here. Uh, I think one that's not on this list is that we're also looking for like a like a really ace like app designer. So if you have any like you know any designer friends who want to push pixels and, and help us create some some sweet uh, utilities for our audience, that'd be great. Yeah. Any uh, performance issues with the UI? Or, um, oh hell yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so JavaScript being single-threaded, there's a lot of things that can block. 
and like your UI suffers, um, there's there's a big part of the React Native community that's like focused on performance, and they're trying to offload things like animations, like uh, sorry, layout animations, back to like the native side, so that the JavaScript isn't you know notwithstanding, it'll just run. Uh, one of the things that we found really useful is there's a module called Interaction Manager, and you can actually like defer most of your heavy logic, or if you have like you know like big processes that you need to run, get your view transitioned in, and then. Uh, kick those processes over and there's like there's some helpers that make that pretty easy But we've actually found certainly like the dynamic stuff like tracking with a thumb and like having things push into one another All that stuff has been super easy to work with and it's all in JavaScript Yeah, one thing I actually overheard Ben talking about with uh, another developer here earlier. Um, I apologize but I don't remember who it was but it, um, the, the point was just because it works okay in your simulator doesn't mean it works fine on your production device so you know, always check it on a variety of devices just to make sure that everything looks fine and dandy on those phones as well. Definitely. Yeah. Another question with Scala Dash. Can you actually uh, write tests that runs on the device with Scala Dash? I actually believe you can. Um, I didn't poke that much into it, but they have, uh, I believe if you go to their website, they have this whole, I'm not sure if it's a SaaS type of thing, but they have a service of some sort that lets you write code that, or tests that will run on some kind of cloud that is linked to some device somehow. It's something like that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. another like reason we chose Calabash is because they also support Android. So we're hoping for a twofer there, like and our tests will just run on Android when we support that platform. Yes? Did you guys vet any other testing frameworks besides Jest, uh, such as like Mocha or uh, Ava, it's pretty new? Um, yeah, so you know we, we have a big affinity for Jasmine and Mocha's amazing too and all that, but uh, we really wanted to try and use Jest, at least with this first project, because it ships with React Native. And we're like, well, surely they've thought through how this works. And no, and they don't really care about testing like we do. And that's OK. So next time around, you know, the nice thing is you don't have to worry about side effects. In our mobile web app, we had um, we had an awesome developer who's actually here uh, tonight who like figured out like you know how to get rid of pollution and how to like to, like tap into your um, your like user context like using this and and just really cleaned up our unit tests a lot because we had a lot of problems with if you ran them out of sequence and and you know um, and a lot of kludge and what we found with Jest at least with all that auto mocking is you don't run into those issues and you don't have to like be super smart to like prepare for them. Yeah. So um, I admire your pioneering attitude and like bravery. Um, but for teams that are maybe less skilled, maybe smaller, um, how long would you say one should wait? Do, do you have any prediction based on this, the velocity of, the, of React Native um, for them to maybe dive in, would it be more stable? I mean, you know, look, look to like the needs of your business and like what your long-term strategies are. Like the way that we're looking at this app is it's us also just figuring out how to get something on the app store, how do we get users into it, and we're not betting the farm on it. So I would say like get it, get it going now, get it into production, like hammer out these issues along with everybody else because it's fun. And uh, but if, if it's like your money maker you're talking about, like too soon, I think. <laughs> Unless you have a team the size of Facebook or your Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Right, so when testing, why don't you use like a JS bundle instead of a package or something? Yeah. It's probably a great idea. I'll totally write it down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what flux implementation are you using? And how are you guys uh, handling like data coming in and out of view? Yeah. So for this app, we used Alt. Uh, we won't be doing that again because uh, the maintainer of that library. Has, there, like right now, it really requires um, React, and we're like, hey, have you thought about like you know taking that like that dependency out so you could inject React, React Native? He's like, no, nah, just like change the source. We're like, cool, not gonna do that. <laughs> like, so, um, but we've been experimenting with both Reflux and Redux, and uh, both are fantastic options. And it's like less boilerplate. Uh, you know, we uh, we're also like trying to like coordinate our efforts so that our mobile web experience and our desktop experience are also run from Redux or Reflux. And we want to really have like a lot of shared business logic 
where you know like I think the, the the goal with React Native is to learn once and write anywhere and so that's like what we're trying to steer like our team towards going forward so I'm biased because I pushed to both alt and redux but you should avoid reflux it's super old yeah all right that's that's what we've been hearing too. old as in a lot of people aren't contributing anymore or old as in it's just like it, it was started way before the other ones and made some incorrect design decisions. Uh, I mean, it was the first one that came out. Like, a lot of it has been updated for, like, ES6 functionality. Oh, OK. Like, I swear for me, it was not one of the core concerns for the developer. Like, Spoik is super sharp. He was there first. But, like, people have been on top of the decisions they made. Like, Alt, I mean, Josh is a cool guy. I think it's a really good low boilerplate framework. If you like not functional stuff, it's super cool. I mean, Redux is what everyone uses. The decorators so. are beautiful, right? Uh, they actually just, like, they actually now support like, a lot of cool stuff. It's yeah. broken out different, like, packages now. It just doesn't work with React Native out of the box, and we didn't want to have yeah. to fork it and maintain it and merge. And, and again, Redux, like, has such a huge user base, you get a lot out of the, and it's actually a great fit if you don't need to do a lot of stuff with binding. And of course, you want data binding with Relay. Relay's awesome. <laughs> we're going to get the unidirectional thing down and then we'll, we'll... saw that a couple of people at the back had their hands up. Can you speak to hot swapping with React Native apps? This is Emily. Do you want to talk about this? No. <laughs> uh, we have hot swapping in our webpack. The problem is the simulator has to, you have to manually hit the uh, command R to like re refresh mm -hmm. it. It seems. I mean, it's weird because like you, you're using Socket IO if you're debugging in Chrome, which is a cool feature with React Native. You can actually push your app through Chrome and like use the the React debug kit to like look at your markup and your styles and everything. Uh, we didn't get into a lot of the tooling that comes with it, but it's it's like top notch. Um, but that's like the limitation that at least we came up against. Has anybody got hot loading working with React Native? So the latest React Native, if you command D, where you would normally open Chrome Debugger, it yeah. has a live reloading option right in that menu. Booyah. Thank you, Tom. So that, you know, <laughs> nice. Shout out to Tom. Do you use App Hub or Twitch for streaming support? We are using App Hub currently. Uh, it's been pretty good. Like uh, they, so there are a lot of things that break all the time, and but like they're very fast about fixing that. And it's not really about them so much. Like it's a problem you have. Uh, I think with a lot of these kind of services, uh, like we were also using uh, Fastlane has all these really great iOS tools for shipping stuff, and we were using uh, Onboard to like get people into uh, test flight. But the problem is every time iTunes Connect changes something under the hood, it breaks the API that's using these all these private things it's not supposed to to get it to work. And so you you know constantly have to like maintain it. And we feel like there's a little bit of that pain still, but like it's really smart, for instance, if you have users who haven't upgraded to the latest version of the app, they can have the latest version of the JavaScript for that app that is functional with that app versus like, you know, and you can like hot swap their code in their session. Uh, you can just update it the next time they come in. You can give them nice little messages and you avoid like all of that app store approval process from Apple, which is great. When we say break, it breaks you rather than your users. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so, and also, like, your code is still shipping with a version of JavaScript that you've shipped it with. So unless, like, your API implementations have changed, which I still recommend, like, data model changes go with iTunes pushes and things like that, probably. Uh, it's really great if you want to, like, swap something quickly, if you want to run an A-B test. There's some great React Native A-B uh, testing frameworks out there. Uh, so. It's just like a great way to like get more feedback more quickly. <coughs> so um, we have the space booked until 8.30. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time left, so we're just going to be kind of uh, going around. And if any of you guys wants to talk to us about our work or anything we do over here, like feel free to come up to any of us. We'll be more than happy to answer any questions. <laughs>